CCTV in China. It's a totally government-owned public broadcaster, but as you can guess, it reflects a pro-government a propaganda messages, and there is a, a significant amount of political interference from the Communist Party of China, but massive amount of their revenues come from advertising. Uh, I'm not uh, emphasizing too much about BBC because BBC is the dominant and the, probably the origin, very origin of the public broadcasting in the world. License fees account for 73% and uh, all the commercial businesses uh, is 19% and the government grants are 6% of the total revenues. BBC has been successful avoiding political interference, uh, but uh, we cannot say that BBC is totally independent and I'm sure uh, top management are all, also a constant pressure from the government. So, let's talk about public broadcasting service in the United States. It's more community-based, non-profit organizations, and the sources of that income is private donations, 60%, and the federal funding is close to 20%. And there's corporate underwriting, which is considered uh, very similar to commercial ad advertising. So, editorial independence is very important, and every, everybody in this country believes the PBS is fair and maintain neutral grounds. But the problem of PBS in this country is low viewership. And uh, most of it, it is from limited programming. Because when public broadcasting was established in the 1960s, 1967, most commercial networks didn't want public broadcasting directly competing with them. So programming content should be education, information, and culture. So it is a very narrowly based audiences. And there are very, um, I mean, there are some audience analysis report from regional public broadcasting stations. And it all indicates that main viewership of public broadcasting is based on a select group of people instead of the entire citizens of the United States. Most of all, there is an insufficient public funding and revenues, and it will lead to low viewership rating most of the time. So you don't have money to produce quality programming, so you just um, keep producing you know, programming that is targeted for niche market. There are other public broadcasters, although we don't hear and watch them very well. PBS is obviously for US audience. The Voice of America, Al Hura, and the Radio Free Europe, Radio Free Asia, they are, they are all international uh, broadcasters, almost 100% funded directly from the state government. So when we hear about Voice of America, Al Hura, Radio Free Europe, Radio Free Asia. Are they objective, middle of the road broadcasters or are they reflecting government propaganda? So, here's my take. At national level, government funded public broadcaster, public service broadcaster, as Robert McChesney suggested, it requires a massive investment, but it will invite political interference. And most of the 100% direct funding from the government means it will produce pro-government slang. American World Service will, may become a propaganda channel as well. And this is the point I'm trying to make. Public broadcasting should be based on not direct government funding and subsidies. It should be based on viewer license fees. In South Korea, we pay about $2 a month. And in other countries, probably 5 to $10 a month for viewer license fee. And when you buy television sets, some countries just uh, include those license fee 
at the cost of the television set. So this is the way American public broadcasting should use to strengthen its operation, not based on the government subsidies. But do you remember what happened to President Obama's medical insurance reform bill? People, some people didn't like it. And when the bill passed, I thought, wow, America is making a progress. But what happened? The Congress, I mean, it's just a partisan debate and it was reversed. Now we don't have medical insurance reform bill anymore. So the question is, are Americans are willing to pay TV license fees? What if you will be asked to pay $2 a month for public television? Well, $2 is nothing I can pay. Uh, but we are in academia or in professional world paying some bucks for public broadcasting, we can endure. But some people may not. At local level, Public service broadcasting may succeed because the total investment is relatively smaller, but local broadcasting will always suffer from a narrowly defined audience and low viewership. We have a, a public access channel uh, where I live in Colorado, and what I see is just a, you know the city announcements and the public relations materials. Uh, if we hire a couple of journalists, un unemployed journalists, by using America Corps and other things, well, it might, uh, we, we might see some improvements, but I don't think that will improve public media after all. So, before we discuss how to get the money from the federal government directly, as Robert McChesney and other scholars uh, argue, I'd rather ask them to consider licensing fees from the viewers. People should pay for what they should watch, not the government. And advertising is something that we should consider. Robert Matt Chesney and other scholars have a consistent claim over the last three decades Commercial profit-driven, market-driven, commercial media in this country is a danger. And it will kill American journalists. But some public broadcasters in East Asia, they successfully combine commercial and public characteristics together in the form of public broadcasting, and they succeed. And advertising is a strong revenue uh, tool for some broadcasters in the Middle East Al Jazeera and South Korea's KBS. And even Chinese central television had a number of advertising. Can you believe that? And public broadcasters should strengthen its programming by embracing more entertainment content. America, America's Got Talent, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire, Survivors, uh, you know, these shows can be produced on public television. Again, Robert McChesney has consistently argued profit-driven corporate commercial media hurt U.S. democracy. But my take is publicly funded or government subsidized broadcast media may threaten the core of democracy. Because if you receive money 100% from the politicians, then you will have to reflect their political interest. So this publicly funded media in the United States to build failing American journalism, well, although it sounds very attractive, but I think it's just a romantic proposition. And we have to think a little bit more seriously about combining some of the failing commercial media with the public media. There is no type Economy formula to make public journalism succeed. It's just a combination of commercial media with public broadcast. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Kim. So we do have quite a bit of time here for questions, comments. 
Um, anything from the floor? Yeah, we'll start in the back. Mr. Madison, yes. uh, the uh, class that you observed, how many students were in that class? Uh, I was uh, 24. Okay, and it was, it, was it just a, uh, was it a journalism class? No, it was an elective. Uh, so the way that, student, that particular uh, elementary school is organized is they have, uh, you know, the, the core components of, you know, reading and math and all that in the mornings, and then they have a, an afternoon where there are various teachers who are offering kind of elective type programs that students can sign up for. Okay. Okay, uh, you're next. Um, not to, like, attack your premise, but people aren't going to pay $2 a month to watch public television because they're already fundraised several times a year and the people that want to donate, that watch the channel, either donate or don't, and the rest of the people don't care. I mean, they're not going to, they're not going to give money to it, I don't think, and I also think that saying to put shows like American Idol on PBS, are you kidding me? <laughs> That's not going to happen. It's too commercially driven. Okay. Do, do you want to respond? Uh, yes. Good. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, I think entertainment is what makes people watch television these days. Uh, if you have educational, informational, cultural content, people like it, I like it, and uh, many uh, viewers of the PBS and the NPR, the radio, um, they are my colleagues at the university. They are elite group of people in this society, and it doesn't represent, you know, grassroots American population. So when people talking about public television, they have perception that oh, it has you know very educational, cultural, and informational program, and I just don't want to watch American Idol. Clouds. Uh, now we are talking about ourselves. People don't watch those television very much as much as we think they would. Okay, so that's why it is important to strengthen, uh, you know, more diverse programming content and public broadcasting. Otherwise, public broadcasting will have a select group of you know, high society the viewers, but which is not really enough to support their financial structure. That's my not, argument. Okay, but they're not even keeping the programming on the major networks. They're canceling shows like, besides the soaps, they've canceled a lot of major television shows like V and Brothers and Sisters. If they can't even keep the programming on the networks, I don't think you have any chance of getting them on public television. Many East Asian Television networks, including uh, the KBS in South Korea, they produce soap operas, reality shows, and they export those programming contents all over uh, Asia and Pacific countries, and that becomes a major source of funding to strengthen their operation. So I'm just talking about financial aspects of how to strengthen public broadcasting. I'm not just uh, talking about you know how to you know put more dirty contents on public broadcasts. Okay. Well, I, 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 I think, I think how, how the case study that I did is relevant is that it, it really has, what this really, really has to do with is what kind of values are we cultivating with kids at the fourth and fifth grade level about the relevance of civic engagement, of critical thinking, you know, if, if we don't start to put some emphasis in uh, because as we know, uh, with the way of standardized testing and everything else, that all the emphasis is now on, uh, you know, on uh, English and, and math scores and, and the social studies, and in some cases the science courses are taking a back seat, and we've got situations where, where teachers are teaching to the test as opposed to teaching what the test is supposed to measure. Um, and so these conversations about civics and government you know, aren't even occurring in the same ways that they did when we were in school. And so, unless you cultivate that, that you know, that, that awareness at that age, you're not going to have a generation that cares. And I think we're sort of seeing that, that right now. Um, the other thing I wanted to say is that um, how many people in this room listen to NPR? 
Okay, that's something like a, a, we like a lot of things, you know. And I think there's a distinction about NPR and the, the cultural sort of um, place that it holds that's very different than PBS television. And part of that is, is that PBS is not a network. It's a bunch of, of independent entities who, who, who bargain and who buy programs, and many of them are struggling, and some of them are associated with colleges and universities. And there's no one specific, you know, there, there, there are different outlets that syndicate and distribute shows, but it's pretty much dependent on, you know, uh, somebody with the gravitas of a, you know, of a uh, um, uh, Ken Burns, you know, who comes along with a big kind of epic project and can get you know, like Ford or somebody like that behind it that, that drives that programming. So there's not a lot of programming that's on PBS, and it doesn't necessarily speak with one voice, whereas NPR, I would argue, has this brand that's that's more distinctive. Yes, there are those who, conservatives who suggest that it's you know that it's biased or right or, or left wing or whatever else. But I don't know. When I listen to NPR, I feel like it's a place where I can go and I can get like valid information that's factual and and I can count on that in a way that I can no longer depend on um, you know even the major networks you know NBC and CBS and ABC to to spend the amount of time discussing some of the pertinent issues that are relevant to how we elect the next president. Okay, let's go to okay, the Okay, uh, I actually, with all due respect, people say when they mean the opposite, I didn't want to challenge the premise of the second paper. Firstly, your starting point, which is you know, a binary separation between educational television and entertainment television, is completely arguable. There's a whole space whereby entertainment can be uh, intelligent, can be what I think you mean by educational. And to accept that dichotomy is the beginning of the end. Because if you say, look, if it's entertaining, people want to watch it, well, it's not entertaining, it's not, not educational and vice versa. You're finished to start with. Secondly, I'm not a magician, but you're deploying partial arguments when you say you go from, well, there are some examples where public funding has distorted um, the uh, objectivity, itself an arguable word, um, of, of television. Um, therefore, public funding um, will undermine democracy. There are lots of different examples of armatures which could protect public broadcasting of integrity and indeed popularity from direct political pressure, as indeed even the journalists who work for Murdoch newspapers, I mean some of them are doing, have clearly been doing very, very bad and naughty things, some of them continue doing interesting reporting, so it's never quite as Manichaean or as black and white as, as um, I think your argument would suggest. And the, the, the kind of notion that, well, um, I mean even within any commercial system, there are forms of hidden, you say, you can't ask for license fees, but every time I buy a packet of Kellogg's, I'm paying for the commodity structure, for advertising agencies, for televisions which advertise, actually American television would seem to be more interested about selling drugs than selling um, <laughs> <laughs> but that's probably you, the wrong first impression. But you, know, uh, you know, when you pay for the drugs, you pay for the advertisement which told you that that drug will help your gout or migraine or whatever. So, you know, it's all I would argue for in a summary phrase is a bit more complexity and maybe, given the scale of ecological and economic crises facing our little world, a little bit more romanticism. <laughs> Response? Uh, yes, uh, I'm happy to. Uh, well, I just don't want to make my argument as, um, you know, completely at one side of the continuum. Uh, as I said, I think Robert Manchesney and other scholars' suggestion to strengthen public broadcasting in this country, I think it's a, an excellent argument. The problem is they specifically zeroed in how to fund public broadcasting is from direct government subsidy. That bothers me a lot. And instead of considering uh, placing some viewer uh, reception fee. That's what uh, East Asian countries use. Uh, the licensing fee is called reception fee. So if you have a television set or any computer satellite uh, you know, receiving uh, tools, 
then you have to pay money. But does that concept is a viable uh, argument in this country? So if you have a television set, if you watch any television channels, are you willing to pay license fee? So in this country, it's, it's a very hard sell. If you ask the viewers directly, so are you willing to pay? But if you have a consumer electronics, and that includes you know, the fund for public broadcasting, for instance, it might be easier. The problem is, will those commercial manufacturer consumer electronics will buy the argument as well? So it is a very, very difficult. And in some European countries and East Asian countries, uh, public broadcasting systems uh, is mostly, of course, we have local uh, television stations, public television stations, but it's a centralized public broadcasting which is easier to control and easier to operate uh, based on viewer license fee. In this country, it is extremely decentralized and uh, just uh, you know, funding for public broadcasting is really difficult, especially if you're talking about government subsidies. Uh, that's my argument. Well, I was just going to say, I, I think, um, and I'm not the first person to observe this, but I think in terms of television now, people no longer watch networks, they watch programs. Um, there's not that kind of allegiance to, you know, must-see TV on Tuesday nights on NBC or, or that kind of thing. And, you know, there have been some instances where uh, certain uh, uh, types of shows on PBS have garnered an audience, maybe not a huge audience, but, you know, to what comes to mind, things like the Antique Road Show or Julia Child back in the day, or, you know, Sesame Street, you know, where it was kind of like, those were, th those you watched because they were offering something that you, you necessarily couldn't get elsewhere. That being said, I also think there is a problem when, when things are, are only uh, driven by uh, popularity and, and, and commercialism. I mean, I'm, I'm not that old, but I mean, what I do remember uh, in, in my studying of the era of you know, Edward R. Murrow, who stood up to you know, McCarthyism, um, there was this sense of this public trust that we're here to do more than just make money. You know, and even though in the end, you know, the programming he was doing didn't, didn't necessarily prevail, there, there was this sense that the journalism was about having a responsibility to make sure that that uh, that people are informed and that they they can make um, you know decisions, and that it was about the public good. And I and I think unless we continue to cultivate that kind of conversation amongst young people, you know, we've got a whole generation that have no idea that that history exists in our in our media. You know, they have no. I mean, you heard all our undergraduates, and you mentioned things like fairness doctrine, or, you know, or you know, uh, if you ask them who controls the the, the media or, or who owns the airwaves, they tell you Comcast, and they aren't far from being inaccurate. Okay, right here in the front. There, two, two. The first is that um, the core of investigatory journalism is is still in newspapers rather than broadcasting. And the problem in newspapers, if it wasn't the internet and the flight of advertising to the internet, the, the economic model of newspapers in this country were bust before that. Uh, advertising uh, revenues were going up and uh, uh, um, readership was going down, and that was a result of a whole lot of leverage buyouts where uh, they were upping the amount of profit that they needed to make from a really lot of loss-making institutions. And the ones that survived uh, have uh, uh, trust stru structures by and large of various kinds, uh, which protect uh, them and, and which provide other sources of, uh, of revenue besides uh, advertising. If you think of the, what's the St. Petersburg newspaper? Uh, 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 yeah, the, the, the Pointer newspaper. The point, the point, the, yeah, I mean, it's not, not the Pointer Institute. The Nelson Pointer created a trust to, to uh, maintain the ownership of the... the but it's a, it's yeah. a piece of the Gazette or something yeah. like that. Yeah. And, and, and that, that's, uh, that's run by a, 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 a trust which, is, uh, um, it, which bears the, uh, the legacy of the, uh, of the dead uh, uh, founder of that trust and makes a lot of money out of other stuff. But there is built into that trust a, a guarantee that the journalism will not 
will not be uh, affected by the profitability of the rest of the operation. Indeed, the, the rest of the operation is there just to suit, just to subsidise the journalism. Same sort of thing is true of the Scott Trust. It's not so much the trust structure, it's that uh, the trustees very sensibly bought up uh, trade uh, magazines and so on, uh, which make an enormous amount of money. The Economist magazine, for example, uh, has a, uh, a business which is quite apart from the magazine in terms of financial information which it sells at great profit all over, all over the world and that's what pays for the Economist magazine. So there are all sorts of different kinds of, uh, if you apply the same kind of argument to public broadcasting, there are all sorts of different kinds of public broadcasting and none of those public broadcasters that you all call public broadcasters because they were funded by the state or had some funding by the state are, you know, even vaguely comparable to one another because they're not vague, because they're not all operating according to the same kind of uh, normative uh, structures uh, and they're not all uh, uh, dedicated uh, to independent and fair and impartial uh, journalism and so on and they don't have the same kinds of uh, same kinds of norms that um, that some of these newspapers and the BBC and so on uh, and the Guardian have. So they're quite they're quite uh, they're quite different. So what you've got to have to look at is not just funding. Actually, the funding in public broadcasting is bloody cheap compared to how much you pay for television uh, and compared to how much you pay for cable systems and so on. I mean, in in in, in Britain, I, don't, I think it costs you something like 10 times as much for Sky Television than it cost you for the BBC. <coughs> and yet people watch more, more BBC than they do Sky Television. So uh, it's well, not that... It's BBC? not that... One funds BBC. Licensed fee. Licensed fee. Licensed fee. And commercial. And, com and, and commercial. And it's, it, it has the most entertaining programs as well. Right. So, so it's not... Again, I agree with, with everything that you said, that it's much, much more complex than uh, your analysis is, is, is suggesting. One of the problems with commercial funding is that once commercial funding goes over roughly 50%, uh, it becomes dominant. And it doesn't matter even if it's state-controlled television. New Zealand, television New Zealand is state-owned. State right? But its funding is about 90% commercial. It is an entirely commercial television uh, um, uh, network. Okay. Uh, and, and yet you would call it, because it's state-owned and so on, um, public broadcasting with public commercial broadcasting. Well, my, argument, respond, and then I want to get to some my argument is, again, I'm not totally discounting the, uh, you know, the value of public broadcasting with various funding structures, but my point is, the most successful public broadcasting in East Asia and uh, some of the other parts of the world is based on viewers direct funding, <coughs> as you just explained in detail. If the funding comes from the government, just like Robert McChesney and other scholars argued, it may not succeed. That's my argument. But, but my point is that it doesn't matter where the money comes <laughs> from. You need, the, you need the structures of management to ward off the journalism, you, 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 you to ward off the journalism from the from the funding. Doesn't matter where the money comes from. You just said New Zealand uh, public television is what ninety percent commercial. Right, and it's rubbish. Yeah, did it's I rubbish. say in my presentation? It's not commercialism it be, has destroyed. It should be a combination of advertising commercial characteristics and the viewers' direct funding. That's the most successful model in some of the regions I took as an example. I'm not saying. Public broadcasting is universal, as I said uh, in part of my presentation. It is different, but I'm just trying to find some of the successful models, and we can learn some successful cases. But you missed the point. Funding is not the point. See, you, you, guys, you guys need to cover the red right card. The, the, the question of revenue models is what we spend at least half our time talking about. Right. Right. Okay. Next. Uh, I want to get uh, over to Ed here yeah. with your uh, your presentation started out talking about the cable companies being required to provide access channels. Right. 
how does that fit in with the class? Is that how they, they that's where they distribute it. So their show is distributed via uh, the public access channel. The public access channel's in jeopardy right now. Uh, a lot of them are disappearing in major cities around around the world um, and around the, the country. Uh, Portland has a very strong uh, public access system. Uh, how would you make the argument for preserving that system, given how you've used it? Well, it's you know that was part of the discussion in the in the in the, pre in the previous uh, group here. I, um, you know, I think it only exists because it was mandated as a in order to get the the uh, you know the, the franchise. You know, uh, for the cable systems, the dominant cable systems. So for Comcast and uh, Time Warner, when they were you know, in, the, in the 80s and early days of cable, you know, there was, there was basically this discussion: you got to you got to pony up something, <laughs> you know, to preserve this this public voice. Now, there there are different communities, like you say, Portland here it's fairly robust. Um, in the in the uh, uh, Bay Area, there's some cable, you know, you see it's fairly robust, but there's other cities where, you know, there's people throwing apples at each other, you know, so, I don't know, <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't know, you know, I don't know if we're in a, in a regulatory, if we're in a climate where there's going to be regulation to preserve that, and with so many different channels to, to view, you know, I, I, would, I would dare guess what a fraction of people are actually watching public access television. What in my study that I'm doing, I'm not so sure it's even so much about who's watching it, but the very fact that students are having an opportunity to know that they can have access to people that are important, that these people will talk to them, that they can engage, that they can write questions, and they can they can they can speak, and that their voice matters. You know, perhaps for at least at the level I'm looking at it, to have more of a cultivation of those opportunities for young people. In the long run, it makes more of a difference than how many people actually watch their show right now. Let me just follow up. And uh, would your program be successful if it didn't have an outlet at all? Uh, no, probably not. But I think there's school place. Huh? Yeah, I've seen lots of school place. Yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah. you know, there's the internet. You can put something up on YouTube like that now. Uh, I do think, in the research that I'm doing, and specifically for my dissertation, I'll just say it's been a, um, just a fraction. Of Mentioning about this, I'm studying uh, the school that you went to. Palo Alto he's, High he's doing his dissertation research at my high school. Yeah, right. So, <laughs> so, uh, so Palo Alto High School, uh, which of course is across the street from Stanford, and so that's that's part of it. When I tell people this, uh, they have the largest scholastic journalism program in the country. They have close to 500 students. I have a student body of 1,800, producing seven different publications, all student run. Um, and it's it's quite amazing to see. They do a free camera. You know, five-minute newscast daily. They do. They have a web uh, publication. They have a magazine. They have a sports magazine. That's uh, you know, that's the equivalent of a high school version of Sports Illustrated, all produced by students. And what they've done there is they've created this culture where being in the journalism program is cool because you you actually have some say. And the and the key component of it that I'm finding out that's important is is this distinction between homework that you turn into a teacher, to one person who grades it and hands it back to you, and journalism that gets published, that your peers read, that your community reads. And so therefore, there's a whole other level of commitment in doing that work that transcends school assignment is the way that we've, known, we've been known to think of it. And so that's what I would answer your question with, is that these kids, they realize that you know it's not whether it's not quite a question whether a dozen people or just their aunts and uncles see it, but somebody's going to see it, and so therefore there's an extra level of commitment they bring to uh, to those assignments. Okay, no, okay, yeah, you you're next in the black. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, uh, just to go back to public broadcasting, you know, I was thinking about maybe there's a way to present it that is different from what we have discussed and. Heard so far that would make it like easier to sell to viewers, you know, for people to pay for it. So let's say you did, you, you instead of saying, do you want to, to to finance a public broadcaster? Everybody will say no. Do you want to uh, fund intelligent and valuable information about your governments, your society, your community? Maybe. No. Well, maybe they would say mm, maybe. 
and then you find the model. If it's the word public in the public broadcasting that is uh, irritating, just take it out. Find the model that people will, you know, that people will buy. And in many, you know, buying in the many definitions you can have with the word buying, you know. Because you're a scholar, you're in the United States, I mean. You know, just do it. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I, I'm, not so, I'm not so concerned about, I, you know, I, I immediately thought, I looked on my phone to, to look at the history of C-SPAN, you know, uh, which is, you know, government enacted by Congress and government. And you turn that on and they have the conservative phone line and the moderate phone line and the liberal phone line, and people call and they say whatever they say, and there's no challenging of like, or, or no, that's not accurate, or, you know, and McChesney, interestingly enough, in some of his books, talks about how in the early days of, you know, colonial journalism, it was very fierce, and it was very, you know, they were, there was no pulling no punches, there was, I mean, there was, you know, they, they weren't pulling punches in terms of their opinion, and I think, you know, sometimes um, we, we, fear, we fear that. There's a lot of debate about whether or not, you know, Fox News is polarizing you know, this side and MSNBC polarizing that side is bad for democracy. But perhaps, you know, given by the ratings and the people they attract, it's actually getting people interested and engaged, you know. And, and there is, I do think there is a concern about people only listening to the media that they already agree with and not hearing other opinions. I mean, it's a complicated thing. It's not, it's not simple. Okay, I'm, I'm going to take one more, and then I, I got a last word I want to get her out this up, so I, I'll try and be brief. Um, I really like seeing that education, education practice, but I, I think you need to get it into the curriculum. You don't call it journalism, you call it media studies. Now, I come from New Zealand where we have three years of media studies offered at high school. Um, that has been there nearly 10 years in, in the making, and it's, it sits beside English and history with the same authority now. No students do a mixture of practice and uh, production and critical theory. And they come out not just to be journalists, but come out knowing about how the media works. But uh, I don't know if you, by doing this, you're actually uh, and, and assisting students to know how the media works, they know how to make media, but they don't know how the media works in a, in a very broad sense. So there is, a, there is an association in America called the uh, National Association of Media Literacy and mm -hmm. Education, and they are pushing them. Very fragmented. You really need to push it as a school subject. I'm curious. What was there resistance? Was there resistance? Given that 90 percent of the, your television is subsidized by commercial entities, is there resistance to having media studies that will? No, no, no. They're okay. supported by the Ministry of Education. Okay. Yeah. Right. So. Yeah. I, I would guess that has more to do with the nature of oversight, national oversight of educational yeah. programs, yeah. as opposed to fitting. It's also true that a lot of journalism is subsidized by educational institutions, universities and so on. And some of the best journalism in America is university-based. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we need to wrap up, but I, did, I wanted to share something with you. And some of you will know who the columnist Leonard Pitts is. We tagged him down at Linfield last week. And I think he said something, and I don't think he was talking specifically about whether you want to call it public broadcasting or public service broadcasting or non-commercial broadcasting or community media or whatever, but I thought he made an important point about why you have to have a, a journalism sector that is separate from, uh, separated from the forces of the market and from the forces of the government as you can. And what he said is in the age of the internet, perhaps the greatest legacy of the internet will be in its ability to spread lies. Um, not, in, in, not in its ability to provide access to information, but in its ability to provide access to false information. And I think if there's a place for this kind of non-commercial educational material, it may not be so much in the role of reporting, but it may be in the role of putting those lies to the test and doing fact checking in the way that organizations like PolitiFact do. Uh, and because the, you know, we're always looking for an economic model of how to, you know, how do we carve out a new audience? How do we create new programs? There's lots of people working on that. But um, someone, and I'm sorry I can't attribute this, but um, I have heard the phrase, things that people don't want you to find out 
that's news. Everything else is public relations, right? And I think the role of non-commercial uh, media is to guard against the forces of public relations. And, and any time you have a particularly dominant economic force inside the media, the, the tendency is it's going to become the public relations for those dominant forces, as you show in your presentation. Right? That once you have that strong economic interest, then the, the channel will move towards you know, presenting the views of that strong economic interest. So um, I, I want to thank the panelists for uh, two very different views, very different approaches to public service broadcasting. Thank you to you for great questions and great discussions.